Uh, welcome all to session seven of Five Fellows uh, program. Today we are going to talk about how to develop thesis, and we have Priyank Saroop, partner at Axel, with us. Uh, I think Priyank will uh, introduce himself uh, uh, in a short bit. But one thing I have to say that uh, you know why did I pre pick Priyank uh, for this thesis work is essentially we've worked on a couple of things before, but uh, when we were exploring this topic, he showed me some thesis which in hundred years I cannot make. So much detailed and so many dimensions in it. I said, "Boss, you got to take this session." So he luckily agreed. So here we have uh, uh, Priyank. Uh, Priyank, will you take over, please? Thanks, thanks, Manish. So uh, you know, uh, I've been a VC for nine and a half years now, and before that was completely into tech. Uh, more so that even after MBA, I went back to do product management and project management jobs. And the idea was, I'm good at tech, I would like tech, and stay back. Uh, in tech, that's what that was the intent. So, uh, and the first, uh, you know, I, when I came to, I had no idea what to do, to be honest, right? And my the first assignment, which one of my partners gave me, was uh, go to this particular startup and help them reduce their AWS bill. And I was like, what? Like, I, I thought, uh, you know, when you are in a VC, you end up doing investments, and the first thing is telling me I have to go understand the technical architecture, and I have never been a technical architect even in my uh, tech life. So uh, I was surprised. Okay, what can I do? And uh, so I ended up meeting the CTO, and we went through. I just, I just explained to me what all you do, and where are all your cost buckets, and why you using. So I just asked common sense questions, and uh, I was very surprised that at the end of it, we could reduce the cost, AWS bill by thirty uh, percent. And that essentially leads leads to the fact that uh, as a VC, we are supposed to ask the right questions, and you know, just one on one, you start from there. But over a period of time, we, you know, you kind of build subject matter expertise, and I think that's where, uh, you know, thesis comes in. So uh, we, you know, uh, a VC is a jack of all trades. Essentially, we can't be an expert in everything, but still, we are supposed to make investments. So, um, my journey has been that I ended up I started associate with thesis, did a lot. Uh, uh, you know, work with portfolio companies, and then ended up started doing my own investments. Um, so I have done till now close to 13 investments in the VC space. Uh, they are roughly bucketed. Uh, I would say 33, 33, 33. Uh, so 33 percent are in uh, B2B enterprise uh, marketplaces, so like Bizongo, Zetwork, uh, and, and the like. Another 33 percent are in SaaS. Um, so very, very early stage. I've started doing SaaS investments for the last two, three years only. Um, and so the ones which are announced is uh, Avenir, which is a contract lifecycle management company based on type of service now. Uh, uh, there's another one uh, called Slintel, which is lead intelligence software. And then the re remaining 33% uh, is basically uh, consumer companies or whatever I have tried in consumer. Uh, I would not say I'm a very successful consumer, uh, consumer investor though. Uh, and the last one percent is uh, catch-all. You know, anything which doesn't fit into this, you know, blockchain and everything else that that one percent goes into that. So, so that's a quick and short of my uh, uh, portfolio. And there have been a lot of learnings. So, I, I think uh, you know, as you build thesis. By the way, we have, I'm just diving into the thesis topic. As you start building thesis, you realize you become better at doing uh, investments in thesis. Uh, thesis building. Uh, uh, your first in invest thesis is always very shitty. Uh, the second one might be slightly better. Uh, in my case, what happened was the first thesis I built it turned out to be very nice. So uh, within two three months of joining Axel, I built one thesis and I got a feedback from a partner. This is brilliant. You know, you, you hired a great analyst, and I was very happy. And then I was in that euphoria. And then one month later, I presented another thesis. And 15 minutes into the thesis presentation, the immediate feedback I got was, "This is really bad. Like, like really shitty. Did you put your brain to this?" Like what is happening? <laughs> you know, one month ago I was said, "Yeah, I'm a great analyst," and with one month later, I'm saying I'm bad. Um, so, and by this time, uh, day by day, I would have probably built some 40, 50 odd theses uh, across in the last nine and a half years. Uh, it it takes time. Uh, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and let me just actually uh, dive into it, right? So, what what do I mean by thesis? So, let me just start. Uh, Priyank, uh, just as you get yeah. started, uh, you want to ke take questions as they come or you want to stop and prompt people for questions? 
Oh yeah, whenever, please. I mean, feel free okay. to ask questions uh, as it is. Uh, you know, so sure. no issue at all. And I will give you a time check after one year, one hour, so that you know. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Saturday morning, avocados. Uh, you know, healthy chart and. and Hopefully, uh, so so the idea is uh, why the avocados. Manish was asking me. Uh, so a successful thesis requires a lot of ingredients, and at the end of it, hopefully, it uh, the thesis tastes like a nice dish. Um, that's what we are trying to strive for. So uh, jumping in, uh, you know, this is the goal. You know, the goal is to turn data into information and information into insight. Uh, you know. A lot of us are engineers and tech guys, and we are very analytical. We, uh, as you step into the shoes of being an investor, you will the first thing you want to do is get as much data as possible about the space uh, which you are in. Uh, but you know what makes a a good investor a great investor is insights. So what is it that you know or you can think about which is better than the second the next investor is thinking? Or how are you informed, right? So as you start investing, you know you realize it's, investing is very easy, right? You, everybody lines up at your door to give them money, uh, the, but the insight is what helps you define the great companies out of you know the thousands of companies which you meet every year, um, and uh, that is over a period of time. If your insight is not improving, you will not turn out to be a good investor. I mean, I mean, luck obviously plays a plays a big part, but insight is what uh, drives uh, the wheels. So, uh, so what's a thesis, right? So, uh, thesis is a point of view to invest or not to invest in a business area or a technology field, you know, and um, hopefully you will be ahead of the curve, right? And I think there are two critical parts here, uh, which, so one is we are, what are we trying is we're trying to be ahead of the curve and not behind. And if you can invest in a area in which is just developing and you have the right insights that will become into a large area, you can, Probably take a shot in that area, and if you're successful, your chances that will become into a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar, maybe a you know uh, you know decacorn uh, increases if you're ahead of the curve. Uh, the and, and for example, you know, uh, you know some of you might have already seen the memos on YouTube or on Google or on other such companies. Or for example, Axel invested in Flipkart and. It was an open secret at that point of time that uh, you know Flipkart is there. Everybody knew about it, um, but there were some insights. Uh, let's say around the team, around the space. Uh, why is the right time? At that time, nobody wanted to invest in e-commerce in India. Uh, very few investments were being done. But you know, luckily, our fund had this thesis that e-commerce is going to boom in India, and that this is the right thing to invest in. Um, and that's where we ended up investing, and uh, it, it turned out to be a decker So. Uh, you know, you have to have conviction and you have to have, uh, in a way, a, a thought process which allows you to, you know, figure out where to invest. Also, there is another thought process which is where not to invest. So for the longest period of time, the one of the theses which Manish is talking about and I, I probably showed at the end of the uh, class is, you know, we, decide, we spend a lot of time in uh, whether to invest in uh, OTT platforms and video streaming platforms. Um, and you know, I was the one who was making all the thesis. So, you know, should we invest in the Netflix of India? Should we invest in uh, another YouTube of India? Uh, those kind of questions. Um, and I, I basically went through that whole process, took me a couple of months and I said, hey, you know, we should not invest. Uh, we should not invest in this space because this space is going to be super competitive. A lot of money is going to flow in. And at the end of the day, international players are going to come into the space and they're just going to chew up everybody. And I made that thesis. Uh, so I joined in 2011, uh, and I made that thesis in 2012. Uh, and if we had ended up doing investments in that space uh, at the intro in 12, we would have probably put in a lot of money and have a lot of hard burn about the company uh, in the last, you know, three four years. So luckily, that was a space avoided. But that's also another, you know, objective of building a thesis. So, you know, the other need of why you need to think ahead. Uh, you know, what you see on the board are a lot of like, disruptive technologies which have come in the last uh, few, in the last one decade, like I've been a VC for. And 
uh, you'll see that you know every each of these disruptive technologies creates uh, new value creation opportunities right so it allows that it allows you to end up have finding spaces where billions uh, you know multi billion dollar companies are created like each of them actually have created uh, uh, multiple billion dollar companies in themselves and this is the this is great for us as investors right so this is great for us all everybody who's doing deep tech investing uh, because uh, we end up uh, uh, you know which basically means that as long as science is throwing up disruptive technologies there will always be some new spaces for us to invest in uh, and you know we could find potentially large billion dollar companies uh, however you know the the big thing over here is uh, you know you have to separate the wheat from the chaff you have to figure out which of these companies which of these technologies are going to stand the test of time you know which of these technologies are going to be around for the next 10 to 20 years uh, and you know like for example obviously the famous example is the palm pilot uh, uh, which at that point of time was hey uh, uh you know this is the technology of the future and you know it's every technology gets disrupted at some point of time or not right so uh you know look at fitbit for example you know uh, at the time pioneer in its space in the wearable space uh, uh, but then uh, their stock took a beating because uh, they, it wasn't just doing well and finally ended up in an, in an acquisition so the idea is of all the technologies uh, so each technology has a shelf life but each technology is and within that shelf life you have to figure out whether you can create a large company or not uh, and you know you can it has to go public and you have to get an exit and then some of the more successful companies they would essentially become platform they not just one technology but they would have multiple technologies um, with them so so that's the other bit uh, right any any questions till now yeah one question priyank this yeah. is this is amit just i think very interesting point around the shelf life of technologies and i think fitbit is a great example i feel gopro and some of these firms which really did well and yeah. this, so are, is your assessment may you saying look one be cognizant of the shelf life and do this analysis of saying could you still build a big business within that but as an investor are you really betting that this platform will discover what the new technology moves are or it just in blocks and will move into that or are you actually okay as an investor saying look if i the company and then you know what like they'll hit the shelf life they'll probably die or not do so well i'm still okay with that sort of where are you as an investor yeah i think see um, the first time you invest in a company the company should have a should be riding a trend or a core disruptive technology wave and they would come up with some use case from that technology uh, that will help them grow the business from let's say zero revenues to 10 15 million dollars of arr Uh, maybe even up to 100 million depends uh, really on the use case they pick up it but at some point of time the technology they have they have, it has been built on will start to you know go out of fashion or it will become just plain old um, and then at that point of time it really depends on the execution of the company that uh, and the team whether they are able to reinvent themselves pick up another area of opportunity or not so but at the time of investing you can't predict so many things Uh, okay. but you have to for example wearables right so uh, let me give you a rule of thumb right consumer facing technologies change very fast so you know because simply because the the this the those markets are large there's lot more investments going in so the what ends up happening is you will see uh, the disruption which happens in in consumer space is significant so in the last 10 15 years you know this iphone has gone from iphone 3 to you know iphone 11 not iphone i don't know what you know iphone 12 and then you will have foldable screens and um a bunch of those things and new apps coming out so typically anything which is to do on the consumer side there's a lot of disruption but a large value can be created right um uh, having said that if you look at the enterprise space you have still mainframes which are running on cobol and people are paying for it so there is a speed uh, but the i think broader idea is what i'm trying to come at is whatever technology the company is doing you have to understand when you're talking to the founders do they know that this like how long the shelf life if in 3 years that technology is going to get disrupted then and we are going to invest today the company is not going to get enough time to actually build out a large business right yeah. so that yeah. is the challenge yeah got it bank one question yeah this is swadesh yeah um so earlier when you were mentioning about the thesis on the video platforms 
uh, will there be a YouTube of the world of India and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, I I guess this is this is the uh, you know uh, the harder part of building a thesis. What I am getting into now is um, imagining what could be uh, the future uh, form factor or the future channels of uh, consumption, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, you know, TikTok started in 2016. Uh, where it became the short form video platform, right? Um, I don't know what your point of view on uh, whether India was ready uh, back then, but the larger point for the uh, context of this session is uh, how do you uh, make sure that you are taking into account the future uh, form factors or the channels or the platforms which could come on which there is opportunity to create a new business, even if it's, uh, if it's a video platform for this example. So that's a great, that's a great question, right? So uh, thesis is not a theoretical exercise uh, because thesis is we are actually going to put dollars behind it. So yeah. uh, you know, TikTok uh, when it started in China, why could a TikTok not in India could not have started? Uh, to be honest, people tried, right? So if you look at the initial phases of uh, shared chat or initial, there were some other companies in that space which were trying video sharing and they started off doing it. Uh, but I think at that point of time, the macro didn't support it. Like, so TikTok, if you look in China, was built on the fact uh, there are a bunch of things. When, when we look at a particular thing in a particular company, um, there are a bunch of things which don't apply in India, right? Mm. So, so let's look at this, why TikTok became big in China. And this is my thesis. I mean, there will be a lot of lot more smarter answers out there. Mm. Um, one is, uh, in China, all the media is controlled by the government. Right? So there was already a very big uh, uh, culture of live streaming, for example, and people live stream simply because you know if you go in China, China has I think 55 television uh, channels, uh, uh, which are all state channels. They, the state decides, the government decides what they can see, what they can't see. Uh, they have a permission of releasing one movie per month of uh, yeah, one international movie per month yeah. in, in the cinema halls, right? Yeah. Uh, where you know, in, now if you look at, so it's all again controlled by the go Chinese government, it's all edited and all of those things, right? So it's all controlled over there. And we forget that sometimes when you look at, we look at China market and we say live streaming is doing great over there. You know, I, we just don't understand why is live streaming doing great. We don't understand why short form video is doing great. And, and the, the, what happens is there, the natural outlet for them on creativity is, you know, let's go to live streaming. Let's create these short videos. Um, right. And they have, when they started, they had like 600 million people already using mobile phones with data, uh, everybody on WeChat. Um, and, you know, the virality of a platform, the growth is much faster. We have compare that to India. India, I think, has now hit 250 or 300 million WhatsApp users. Uh, not everybody has very good mobile phones or large screen phones and not so much great of data internet connection. And four years ago, or uh, three to four years ago, you know, Geo wasn't there, right? So yeah. uh, at, at that time, TikTok had already started, right? So it became a big phenomenon. And by the time, you know, Indian companies started to play catch up, TikTok landed up in India. And right. they had the financial resources and they had the learnings of the AI, ML, the recommendation engines. They had all the learning to how to create a network effect uh, that they were able to seed all of that uh, content in India and start Tapping up and you know, come as you would already know, or might have already been discussed. Companies with network effect are very hard to break. Yeah. Right. So unless you know that by regulation the government comes and says, hey, you know what you're doing is wrong. So so that's what has happened in particularly TikTok. But the macro in India at that time was essentially uh, geo penetration was not very high. Uh, 4G wasn't very high. Uh, not everybody had smartphones. Even now today in India, not everybody has smartphones. So uh, and then. The incumbent, the Indian players did not really know the playbook on how to build out the business. Right? Right. So, right. so, like for example, artificial meat. Right. So, uh, why isn't there an Indian artificial meat company, whereas there are a large number of U.S. companies that are extremely big, uh, right? And most probably their products will be imported into India as artificial meat. And I doubt that uh, Indian artificial meat company will become very big in the short term. But I, I can be wrong. Right. So. Where the advantage is an artificial meat company in India, if they can figure out the difference between American pallet and Indian pallet, their product could probably be better. So. Got it. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hey, Priyank. Uh, yeah. Ankur, the side, sorry for the last question. No, no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So, uh, while you talked about, you know, uh, the trends to be observed while building this thesis, how do you, let's say, uh, 
uh, make assumptions for regulations like for example this is specifically for autonomous vehicles and drones yeah. you know when it comes to like the entire trend or the entire philosophy can change uh, yeah. once there is some change on the regulations right so how do you go about making assumptions on that side uh yeah that's a very tricky one uh, i don't have a very good answer so there are there are two schools of thought uh, if you're doing a very early stage investment uh, and if the product will get widely adopted then the government will come around and they will accommodate the changes in the uh, regulation so for example a case in point like uber and ola uh, and you know when they initially started uh, in the very first of you one or two years the, the, uh, you know the, the existing taxi guys for example put up a, a court case against them saying that uh, the, the indian laws don't allow these don't allow google maps as a way of uh, calculating billing for taxis you know it was a te- the technology they used for billing was the distance measured on google maps um, and uh, because the the law which is written in taxis in india is uh, uh, it was written in some 1800s it said the the measurement of uh, distance has to be authenticated by a device which has to be approved anywhere in the world um, uh, as a as a uh, public transport for measuring for some some there's some legislation around it so uh, the companies figured out in ireland uh, google maps has actually been allowed as a source of uh, measuring and now if that had not existed i am not sure you know we would have to figure out a way uh, so to make it legal um, or even today like surge pricing you know is deemed illegal in some parts of the country or you know government like delhi government uh, you know delhi government has said this is not legal and all that so i think the regulation changes it takes time so the government cannot anticipate all the things ahead and it takes time for regulation to catch up so the one school of thought is hey you know just go ahead and do the investment if the investment becomes big if it has value for everybody then automatically will government will allow it to run uh, but then there is a second negative part of it some of these companies become big and you have for example tiktok became big and suddenly the government put a ban on tiktok Uh, right and that is you can't anticipate really so you are the only uh, solace there is that you know you uh, and india does not have a structured way of uh, lobbying the government as well so uh, there's no clear answer it's a, it's a gray zone um, but you know if all technologies are disruptive and innovation is going to happen a uh, innovator can't think what is going so you can't put regulation first in your mind to be honest but in in area specifically like gambling or or sin sin or uh, alcohol that's where we are very careful at least actually is when we are investing uh, what is the impact of uh, is going to be so just a additional thought on that uh, and yeah. that would be last is uh, uh, probably de- uh, that uh, regulation could also play a role in what is the primary market and where the company is registered what i got uh, where i got this from i was talking to a couple of uh, cryptocurrency entrepreneurs in the last couple of years and they had to do that apparently they had to move to singapore uh, they had to switch their primary market to outside india to get yeah. traction and get growth and then wait for the regulations to get better uh, yeah yeah so no, that's that's, that's right uh, i mean uh, for example india does not have a policy in e scooters so let's say singapore itself singapore banned e scooters and it took the government uh, i think 14 months to allow some of the e scooter policy and there were all these companies were funded and they had to sit on the sidelines without actually doing anything because singapore is extremely sharp on implementation it's um uh, but but you know regulation also throws up a lot of uh, open areas for in, uh, investment so you look at gdpr compliance or the entire regulatory tech and compliance tech startup space uh, is just built on uh, uh, because startups and businesses have to follow up on regulation uh, for example uh, even like when sox uh, uh, carbon axle compliance rule came you know it, uh, it forced a lot of the companies to adopt uh, financial electro- electronic financial uh, reconciliation uh, because the reporting had to be extremely perfect so regulation also leads to uh, you know investment areas um, and see regulation helps in protection of the com- uh, uh, protection of people right so uh your facial recognition or fake news when regulation says i we will punish all platforms which publish fake news it forces those platforms to develop technology to combat fake news um and that leads the way forward so it's a it's a double edged sword i would say yeah. there's no good answer for that question sure
but but yes regulation plays a heavy role in a lot of these places good so uh, i'll just quickly uh, so these are in my mind these are the five things uh, which you have to keep in mind uh, when building a thesis you know uh, first is uh, just identifying large enough markets if you are going to build a billion dollar company uh, you know your market can't be couple of hundred million it has to be multi billion dollars as well right and the best companies as you are seeing uh, end up having multi billion revenues so let's say you have a company which has a billion dollars in revenue and it's like 20% of the market you know it's, it's huge uh, so the market itself needs to be uh, you know 5 billion right so uh, this is i think one very core aspect to be honest majority of markets in india uh, if you're looking at india investing uh, they would be you will see the starting markets like 300 to 400 million dollars or uh, and then you will go from there for example when we when i built the thesis for investing in uh, taxi for sure so one of my partners were leading and i was associate at that time we sized the market to be like 300 400 million dollars but the market was growing extremely well um, uh, you know 25 to uh, 30% and when i say 400 million dollars i was talking about the commission which you can uh, earn while uh, while running that market so uh, uh, when when you're running a company so the markets have to be very large right and and uh, so and a lot of times this is where the majority of mistake happens uh, when we build thesis either we overestimate the market or we underestimate the market you overestimate the market and you go give a lot of money to the company and the company doesn't work uh, because that market either had a short shelf life or was not large enough um, or you you know don't invest ended up in, end up investing in a company and the company becomes extremely large and you're sitting like you know what the hell i i, I didn't think that this market is going to be very large like for example when the first time people talked about artificial meat to me i was like i don't know whether that's going to be a large market but already i think there are three or four companies are billion dollar plus or or sometimes you know uh, there are going to be new markets which it's very hard to justify right you know when uh, uber or airbnb started uh, at that point of time it was very hard to estimate those market size and that's why a lot of vcs just rejected them so thinking deeply about markets is a very important uh, art actually it's more an art more of an art than a science uh and uh, you know that is a key tenet of how to build a thesis uh second is you know if you are in india you it already takes roughly 10 years for the company to get to some scale and get to be ipo ready and then after that once you invest it it will take the company another 4 to 5 years for it for its ipo value to grow up and become larger and larger so you know you can't invest in a company which is running on a short term trend it just means that whatever core technology they are built on it has to last 15 years or 20 years right and that's why you know a lot of that's where the problem that's the second problem which comes in is let's say blockchain uh, or cryptocurrency when cryptocurrency initially came uh, there was so much debate that you know is this a fad or this is actually real and uh, nobody was able to agree on uh, and there were some people who took a long term view and there were some people who so there were some people who built a thesis that this is here to stay and it's a long term view and there were some people hey you know this is just a fact um, and and there are some winners and there are some losers uh, accordingly um so that's the other part then comes the you know our personal stuff why are we building a thesis right so we are being prepared right so today uh, if i want to understand certain technologies and i think that in 3 years that their time will come i need to start working today and i need to go and start seeing who are the smart people working on that technology today because one of them will start breaking out and i should be ready to invest in them um and by the way you know vcs do this all the time so it is it's a competitive space uh, at any point of time i'm pretty sure each and every vc firm will be working on four to five different theses uh, uh, essentially so i mean we we end up developing what i think 10 theses a year uh, if not more uh, and, and the idea is we have we know everything about that space and so we can go ahead and invest. then comes the entrepreneur right so the we are this is an exercise not in theory right so we are doing all of this so that we sharpen our point of view so that when an investor comes to meet when a entrepreneur comes to meet us we have a unique point of view and we can tell that person or tell that entrepreneur these are the five questions i want an answer for this is how you can improve your business this i don't see this is a market i can give you i can give him sharper feedback on the product now compare that with another vc who is not prepared in that particular market 
they will have zero idea like if, if you ask me today about artificial meat i have zero idea i, I don't know anything right and there's startup who comes to me and talks to me about first uh, they will say you know priyank doesn't know anything i i can then i can only invest in that company uh by i'll tell them hey give me you know a month or so i'll go do research i'll come back and i'll decide uh whereas they somebody else will have a unique point of view already they can just move fast and recognize that it's a very good company and go and invest in that um and uh, by the way for example axel has a few points of views or we are known in that and you get known in the industry for that so people know like for example people know that for ai ml i should come to pi ventures right so people already know that so any ai ml company when they come to pi ventures they have an expectation that it's a fund which is known for ai ml uh point of view they will have very strong feedback and they will take the feedback of a pi ventures much more seriously than let's say some other fund Uh, which is not so well known for AI ML, uh, unless until of course that fund shows that they have a very good point of view, which is the fund that believes in. So that's a that's I, I think this is very important. Um, it gives builds reputation for the fund. It builds reputation for that particular investor. Um, it the entrepreneurs walk away thinking that this person knows me and knows the space. He's an expert, and then you know it just. they will go and tell five other people that if you want to talk about this go and talk to you know this particular like for example in axel uh, you know shaker is known for saas so if you want to go and talk about saas company you have to go and talk to shaker um, so so and that that's how people know uh, about you right the other part is conviction right so no startup uh, goes to a you know success and it's, it's always up and down up and down even the best startup like when i look at i mean in my nine and a half years the one thing i realize it's um to get to a unicorn you know uh, you should be born at the right time your founder should be born at the right time uh, your all the people you hire have to be born at the right time uh, you know the stars have to align uh, you know there is so many things uh, it is so much of luck uh, that uh, you know there will be low points and unless until you have we have the conviction that what we are saying is correct uh, as a investor you will get either very frustrated um or you know your or you will not be able to support the entrepreneur when he is feeling frustrated uh, and that's where the thesis building brings conviction hey we have done the ground work we know where it is uh and this is where we're going and more so this is also important that you know it's not that thesis building finishes off by the time you do the investment actually after you do the investment new data starts coming in you know you are now inside the company you are sitting there you made a choice uh you will hear first hand from the companies customers what they like what they don't like and you have to then go back reevaluate your thesis and say is this going to work or is this not going to work so going back to the video thesis example i would have never predicted that hotstar would become a large platform like i never predicted that right so and hotstar is a large platform right so uh yes i said we will not we should not invest in video but you know you have an example that a company from india has built a large platform uh, and now you have a proliferation of these online platforms uh, essentially so uh, you know there is always a, a counter argument to every thesis uh, also i uh, sorry any questions thank uh, aniket here i just had a quick question you said 10 uh, thesis is what a usual number in investor works every year can i get a sense on what is the So what is the flow of data or how frequently do you update the thesis in case your conviction is challenged or do you yeah, stick so, with that thesis for a number of years so good question so uh, uh, what i said was each fund makes uh, like axel at least is making at least 10 thesis and i think that's a factor of also the the number of the size of the team so we have a very large team uh, we have nine, uh, we have uh, 11 investment managers we have uh, eight to nine uh, analysts so there is a bandwidth in which you can create thesis like right? you know when there was a time when i had joined 9 years ago at that time there were basically you know uh, four partners uh, uh, you know one venture partner one principal uh, and then uh, you know couple of uh, two three of us analysts um so i was at that time producing like one thesis or two thesis a year um and I, to be honest i didn't also know how to do it but now for example the thesis i'm going to show you it took me like one week to build out that I mean, it's not a thesis. It's a, it's a, uh, it's. So I have not been as diligent as I would have been. But I would say, if you were at it, uh, you could probably build out a good thesis uh, in three to six months. Uh, so uh, one investor can probably build out good, nice theses in uh, like two theses a year. 
uh, what we do do is we also build mini theses, right? So mini theses is uh, I have to build two theses in a year or one thesis in a year, uh, but which space do I pick up? Right? So what you, what we do is, or at least I do, you do an exploratory look into the space. So you, I would spend you know two weeks uh, build out, uh, look at all the companies, look at all the trends, look at how much money is being spent, talk to probably five six experts to get a sense whether I think intuitively that this is going to become big or not. And then we do that iteratively. And then once you do it four or five times, you see, okay, this one space looks interesting and we can build out a bigger thesis on top of that. So uh, we call it mini dives. Uh, so mini dives or a mini thesis, essentially a small, you know, it'll be like a very short thesis. And this is, a, it's almost a mini thesis which I'm gonna show you today. So, so that's what it is. You build from there, you get an idea of the space. And then if you don't like it, you drop it, you go to the next one. But it allows you to look at what all has happened and, and whether we should spend our time or not. Yeah, any okay. other questions? Frank, uh, one quick question around, to what extent do you sort of zoom in? So you, you mentioned uh, artificial meat, for example, right? Which yeah. you don't uh, see that being a big market, but yeah. isn't that part of uh, a larger superset of trends of I don't know, around conscious consumption, eco-friendly and stuff like that? And uh, I'm guessing it's possible to, to put numbers behind that and consider that a large market where this is a subset of that. Yeah, I think that's where the challenge, so that's a good question. Uh, when we start building theses, a lot of times what happens is we get stuck in the Uber moments, right? So healthy living, you know, healthy living as a trend uh, is great, but to, for, it, for us to invest, we have to go down and find specific companies where should we should invest in. Uh, so there are two, three parts, two, three uh, sections to that question. Uh, one is what is available in India, right? So uh, for example, uh, if you are if you are an India fund and uh, automatically your deal flows have to come from India and most, it's very unlikely that a company outside of India, uh, let's say sitting in Europe is going to end up taking our money. So we are restricted within the boundaries. Now within that boundary, you and I are not entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have to pick up that flag and say, I'm going to build something around this. So if you go and try to find, let's say, artificial meat companies in India and you identify there are five teams which are doing this, should I invest? Should I not invest? Right? Um, and if the, all the five teams don't meet the quality bar, then, you know, the answer is very simple. But if you are in a space where, you know, let's say SaaS, in which probably hundreds of companies get built in India every, uh, every year, then you need to have a point of view. Of those hundred SaaS companies, you can't go and chase all hundred of them. Uh, which one should I go after? But Coming back, so healthy living as a thesis, you know, how do you put a market size? How much money will be made? Which segment of the market I'm going to make money in? Which is a fad, not a fad? So to be able to invest, you need to have an investment framework which says within healthy living, I'm going to go after, let's say, uh, exercise. Within exercise, I'm going to go after uh, exercises for pregnant women, for example. And within that, I'm going to go after let's say, uh, clothing for exercising for pregnant women, right? It has to be that narrow a definition um, because if you go much more broad ways, then you will be all over the place. And ideally, you will go down to that uh, leaf node and you'll eliminate. Either you'll say, okay, I picked up this space. I realized I can't make investments in this space. Either the market size is too small or there are not enough companies uh, or I don't think that this long term will sustain. Uh, and you just drop that and you go to the next, okay, what is the next thing I can do for exercising for pregnant moms? And, and you kind of, uh, so I would brainstorm and I say, okay, in consumers, in, see, in consumer markets, it's slightly easier. You can, you can, you know, you can, it's easier to think about these things. In technology markets, in deep tech, uh, you know, you have to go look at the research which is coming out. You have to go look at how far the, the technology is from commercialization. So, for example, I've been thinking about quantum computing for a very long time. And now we're starting to see quantum cryptography come into the markets a little bit. But is this the right time for me to invest? Uh, because what I'm seeing today is very early uh, pioneer companies. Maybe it is the right time. But what happens if I invest and the market does not take off? You know, it commercially is not accepted by the customers. Uh, because once I invest, like once the VC invests, the company has to become big in the next six to seven years. Because then by the 10th year, you're starting to exit the company, right? So there's a time boundary condition on us. So there's a timing of the market as well, which you have to play around with. So I hope that, I mean, sorry, the long winded answer, but I hope it answers your question. 
Frank, Frank, one uh, one point on that. Uh, has it ever happened that you uh, or your other partners had a thesis, but there were no interesting uh, teams to fund, and you had to go out maybe evangelize the thesis, but you were very sure that this should happen, and maybe you had to um, uh, sort of uh, create uh, interest in the uh, entrepreneurial yep. community. So, uh, let me show you guys one thesis. This is, uh, this is one of my very old thesis which I had built. Uh, can you guys see this? Mom? Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. So, this thesis was built in as you can see the date, July 2009, uh, July 29, 2014, so six years ago. And in this thesis, uh, I had covered a lot of spaces. So the, uh, so the green spaces are the ones which you think, which I, th I said, I have a good idea, I've built out the markets. And the blue ones are the ones where the thesis is not complete. I have to still do some more time and thinking about it, right? And I said, we as Axel should go and invest in all of these spaces, all all the spaces which you see on the screen. So we should do investment in domestic health. We ended up doing, um, you know, urban, uh, by the way, I mean, I was an associate. I was just saying, hey, we should do something like this. Uh, and we have done actually quite a bit. So I would not say we've done everything. So we did domestic health, urban club, we did food delivery, Swiggy. Uh, uh, and we ended up investing in these companies probably uh, two to three years afterwards, right? So the timing was also right. So, but as a thought exercise, we had, we had done some thought analysis before. Uh, vehicle buying, in second hand, social commerce is happening now as we speak, right? So if you look at Low Road, Misho, SimSim, Bull Bull, all these companies have come up now. Uh, we did investments in cross-border commerce. We haven't done something in warehousing yet. We did road freight, black work. Uh, content creation, we have done a few. Uh, one specifically, for example, Kubrick. Uh, temporary workers we haven't done, uh, LPO we haven't done, uh, MCNs we actually looked at that thesis and said, uh, so uh, this we should re remove. Uh, tutors we did Vedantu, consumer finance we did money view, ride sharing we did, uh, so many of them, bounce, hai, taxi for sure, hai, all of that. Uh, fleet management we didn't do, uh, leasing, uh, so you know, B2B finance we did. So essentially all these investments were done probably two to three years after this thesis was built, right? <coughs> that that's an example, right? So, uh, Frank Arushi here. What yeah. kind of signaling in terms of existing or you know uh, existing startups in those spaces would you look for while developing your thesis? Like the few blocks that you mentioned, some of them had you saw startups already coming. In, for example, yeah. vehicles came up later. So, what yeah. is that sort of starting point or trigger point that you look for in an area while developing your thesis? So, I think the. Uh, so yeah, in, again, in consumers, it's very easy. Consumers, you just basically look at where are people spending money. Consumers and businesses, right? What are essentially what a thesis is, right? So thesis is identifying problems which people have and whether they're going to pay money for it. So the first and um, so that is one set. So you just basically go out and say, where are people are spending money today? And this technology have a role to play in that, right? So uh, domestic health, for example, I think is still an unsolved problem. So Urban Club solves for your plumbers and electricians, but doesn't solve for your calm value, which comes at the house. There will probably be a platform which will get built. And that thesis is very India specific. Now, I doubt that the calm value investment, calm, calm value marketplace, you can do it in US. Maybe you can, I, I don't know. But that's, that's one of the ways to uh, think about it. Right? So you start with where the money is flowing. You know, when, when I joined, I, I used to think of, let's sit down in a room and think of all the blue ocean areas, which nobody else has thought of. And, uh, you know, I'll come up with something which, uh, and then I'll go and find an investment. What I've found is uh, there are already markets which exist in the offline world or in the real world. Uh, and a digital can play a role on that. Uh, or, for example, let's say 3D printing, right? So 3D printing sounds like a very innovative technology, uh, came, came, out, came out of the blue. Uh, but then why? Like, why did somebody even think of it? Well, there must have been some problem which was trying, somebody was trying to solve. Uh, that's a better way of building things. Um, and, and that's where the challenge is, right? So, uh, 
you have to either you are a very conversant and expert in particular area or you're talking to experts to build your knowledge base uh, but you have to have done that homework essentially and most of the time actually entrepreneurs are the ones who uh, guide us right so you will start seeing that uh, there is a wave which comes of investment uh, uh, a lot of startups in the market will show up which are solving the same problem i mean i, I find it just very serendipitous either at the same time you know 15 20 different startups who are working in that area will hit us uh, even though uh, we were uh, we were start talking only to one and that's the time we would start end up being building up pieces which one to choose so sometimes it comes from startup sometimes you go out and see uh, the, there was one point which i think swadesh made which was do we evangelize the thesis i think in my mind i find it very tough so when a idea comes from a vc uh, telling entrepreneurs that you should build idea things around this i think that is a very wrong signal because then the ownership of the idea is the vc and i have seen so many companies where you know the founders end up saying i will do this because priyank is doing doing this uh, then they look at acha i have done what you told me now what is the next thing i should do for you and i am not an expert i can't tell you after step 1 2 3 what is the 4 5 6 thing to do and i think that's where the trouble lies that uh, that's why i don't like to evangelize any uh, thesis to entrepreneurs i will have a point of view on what they are doing if they are in the in the, in the space in which the thesis is being made so i can tell them that hey you know for example uh, uh, let's say b2b so i have seen 15 other b2b companies i am on board of three of them and you have come to me with a b2b marketplace for let's say vaccinations uh, i can tell you these are the problems which can happen and i always tell them the problems which i think i can see if you tell them the solutions then you know they will and they go and implement it and it doesn't work so am i helping them am i a crutch so i don't want to be that right so sorry does this help absolutely thanks okay so uh, let's jump into a sample thesis uh, well, i built one on cyber security uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is not a fully fledged uh, thesis i have worked for roughly 3 to 4 days on it uh, to put it on paper uh, though i have been thinking about cyber security and spending time on cyber security for almost one year now uh, and you also need to understand that axel has a very large cyber security portfolio so i have a few of my colleagues in us and europe uh, who have been talking to over the last one year or so to have broader sense but the broader objective is uh, once you have some thoughts in mind how do you put it on paper so that you can communicate it to the rest of your team as well as how do you make sure that you have a logical process of coming to a conclusion uh, to find uh, companies to go after and look at and one point i didn't make earlier was see the thesis is being built before deal evaluation so the idea is i, I know you guys have gone through a deal evaluation uh, lecture the idea is a thesis allows you to focus on an area and then you go and find companies in that area to evaluate that's the broader uh point so uh, every thesis uh, you should have a executive summary uh, you know which are essentially uh, why we excited about this market so uh, in this particular case cyber security is a large market uh, in india uh, billion dollars in 2019 going to 1.6 billion in 2021 um it's going at a 17% kgr so uh, essentially this will probably become a 5 billion dollar market in the next 5 to 6 years um right second uh Uh, within that uh, cyber security cloud security has a significantly uh, has a significant trend of high growth and uh, then there are uh, india but india has a number of iim startups so that that's a challenge we don't have enough cloud security companies so that's what we're trying to find right so uh, and ideally if i had met a lot of companies i would also say these are the top 3 companies which i really like and i would like to go and talk to them and see uh, if we can do a deal with any one of them <coughs> then we have but you know that's the executive summary right so it summarizes the whole thesis uh the question is uh you start off with the market right so first is there a market here to stay and these are just some of the uh, headlines are picked up from various news website and you can see in the last 30 days and actually in the last 30 days if you look at the uh all these hacking incidents have happened in india 
right? So an academy, 22 million users had information put up for sale. Uh, you know, five lakh, uh, uh, half a million Zoom Zoom accounts up for dark web. Uh, Priyanka Chopra's personal data had, uh, and uh, 9,100 coronavirus team cyber attacks witnessed in India. Uh, so there's uh, the, there is an increasing trend towards hacking and cyber security, which might already have been happening in India, but now it is coming coming into the eyes of the public. It is getting reported. And what's, what is most probably going to end up happening is uh, that because it is getting reported, uh, there will be a pressure on all the businesses to you know, make their systems more secure and cyber security spending in India should go up. But then, so you, there is a pain that there's a hypothesis that cyber security in, uh, in India should go up. So, but is this a big market, right? So globally, uh, you know, in India, globally it is projected that $130 billion will be spent on products in cybersecurity and another, so I'm looking at, uh, at the 2020 number, uh, 42 billion will be spent on you know, salaries uh, and uh, internal spends on cybersecurity, right? So, so it's a huge market globally. Now, now like I said, uh, so Axel, uh, as Axel, I can actually do end up investing in global companies, but let's say if you are an Indian fund, you'll have to be looking at the India market. So is this a large enough market? in India, uh, right? So, and uh, this is a good report from DSCI. So, if you are looking to invest in cybersecurity in India, you know DSCI is a great uh, government body, uh, which actually is, uh, I think they have, they have a very good management focus on um, building, the, doing the right things. So, they actually have done this research and they have come back and said, you know, these are the five segments which we are tracking in India. And of these five segments, these are all products. So, they all have a separate one for services. Of these five uh, products, today India is at a you know one billion dollar market, which is growing at seventeen percent figure. So within this, you know, you can you could just start from here, for example, and you could say within this market, hey, you know, let's look at the, which are the biggest markets going to be in twenty twenty two. Looks like the top two markets are security, IDR, and uh, endpoint security. And let us let me just go dig deeper into those markets and figure out uh, are there companies which I should invest in. And that's a perfectly reasonable approach to build a thesis, right? Um, uh, so let's go further. So we said we, we have established the market in India is large. Uh, there is a need. So now we look at you know billion dollar exits which have happened in cyber. Like is are there large outcomes possible? You know, just because a market is there doesn't mean that it can have large outcomes. Large outcomes require that, uh, you know, you can take a uh, large market share, large outcomes require that uh, a company can become big uh, versus the other company. So essentially there is some sort of network effect is possible. And, and a reflection of that is essentially uh, uh, in, the, in how many exits can happen in cybersecurity. So if you see uh, in the last couple of years, the last five years itself, I think there are some uh, 10, 15 billion dollar exits which have happened in cybersecurity globally, not in India, but globally. Um, so that means that in this market, I'm just using that as a proxy that a large business can be built. And sometimes you will not have an answer like this from the data, right? So uh, when Uber was getting built, it was very hard to think that can it be an extremely large business or not? So sometimes you get, uh, sometimes you have to hypothesize it will become big and these are the conditions on it will become big. Or sometimes you just basically look at, um, uh, available data and say, hey, you know, it's an easy decision. I can already see it's a big market. Then comes the question is, uh, are people, are investors willing to put up money in that business? And typically, you know, it's a, if the if the number of exits are happening, then you will have money available. Um, so you, as you can see here, uh, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, so 2010 to 2019, uh, a lot of money has gone into uh, building cybersecurity, and in fact, in the last four years, uh, the cybersecurity uh, spending uh, and investments financing, which is a blue line, you can see it has grown uh, by 300 percent. So it went from seven billion dollars to close to 30 billion dollars uh, in uh, in financing, as well as the m &A, uh, has jumped by 100 100 uh, percent. So it went from you know 46 billion to uh, 97 or 98 billion dollars. Right. So these are healthy signs of a market where we can put money and build. Um, now, here's a point for deep tech. You know, uh, so cybersecurity ten years ago would have been deep tech. I think now it's a mature market. Uh, but within that mature market, there are segments which are coming up uh, because uh, which are uh, still. I mean, deep tech. Any anyway, cybersecurity requires a lot of deep tech. But what I'm trying to come at is 
normally an extremely deep tech company, you have to be very careful when you invest in how long is the incubation period of the technology, how long will it take for commercialization, how long will it take then finally to get to scale, and then finally how long will it take to get to an IPO or an exit, right? And that's where the tricky part comes in. So sometimes, you know, investors would say, uh, this particular technology is way too early, it's in the incubation stage. Um, uh, maybe I should revisit this company three years later or whenever there's a milestone in the technology development process. Um, and and that's what, uh, you know, you have to be cognizant of. Any questions? Yeah, uh, Priyank, I'm yeah. Ruchi here from Dubai. So I was just wondering, if you go to the previous slide when you say that a uh, large or outcomes possible. So I was wondering, like, as a VC, I think a, um, if a number of large outcomes have already been there, do you think that you are too late for the game? Like, when do you, when do you think you're, like, you just missed it? I think that depends really on the size of the market. So if the size of the market is, you know, uh, 130 billion to $200 billion, uh, you know, annual, annual spends, then you can definitely have multi multiple markets, uh, multiple winners in the market. You can have multiple large companies to be built out. And because let's say a $200 billion market, even if it has, let's say, uh, you know, let's say 20 different segments, each of those segments should be 10 billion. And in each of those, uh, it's a $10 billion segment, you can have, you know, 10, 15 companies in each each segment, uh, which can be big, right? So the, it's, a, it's a large enough market to do a lot of investments in, essentially. Uh, Having said that, if you end up becoming like Google and like search is a huge market, uh, uh, online search, but there is one extremely large dominant player, which is just eating up everything, then obviously, you know, I think it's difficult. But even within that, you might have the technologies which can, uh, you know, search for B2B uh, ads. So, so the long and short of answer is depends really on the market size. How much, how many companies can we sustain in that market? India, for example, let's say domestic consumption. Um, if you look at a market like uh, vegan, vegan cosmetics, right? So, a vegan cosmetics market in India, maybe fifty million dollars. So, one a large company can't be created, and two, it is very easy to create vegan cosmetics. Uh, so, there will be a large number of players in that market. Um, so each of them will be extremely small. So that is not something I'll be excited about. But in a $100 billion market uh, where there can be multiple segments and each segment can have multiple large players, then as a VC, I have a shot of, you know, I can take multiple shots in that market in different segments and hopefully one of them will work out to be a large company. Right? We are building a portfolio essentially. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Right. Yeah. So from what I'm hearing is that this is something that you can do for mature markets. And this actually brings me back to that earlier question that I asked mm -hmm. you. So if it's a new, say, ride sharing, you said Uber yeah. or Airbnb, for example, were uh, not easy decisions for VCs to make initially. Isn't that a limitation of thesis in general? Because you, you, might, you can create a thesis for cybersecurity, but back when ride sharing did not exist, how would you create a yeah. thesis for that? And hence, would it not, uh, would it it'll get stuck at the filter level, right? See, reasons. I think it comes down to the fact that, uh, uh, like for example, the, the marketplaces thesis I showed you, domestic help as a market in India, and I, I gave a number to it. I gave a number of $800 million to it, right? So I actually sat and thought, okay, which are, what are the customer pain points I see, which are not solved by technology today? Right? So I said, okay, so I, my wife keeps on giving about the maids are not professional. So maybe that is one problem which needs to be solved. Uh, so that's the initial inception. Is this a problem? Is there a problem to be solved? Then you say, but I as a VC want it to be a large problem. So I need to figure out how big the market is before I go and saying I should go and invest in our next company. Uh, so then I said, okay, let's put some numbers to it. So we did some maths ground up. Okay, how many households can afford a maid? How much do they pay the maid? So how many maids will there be? And this is the total spend on maids. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, if a, if somebody starts a company, how much will people be willing to pay to them? So you then finally come to that $800 million number. And is that growing or not growing, right? So, and if it is growing, and $800 million is a sizable number for India, and let's go and invest in that space. So even though nothing existed in the market, we were able to build that out uh, by doing just a need analysis and how many people will want to pay for it. 
that kind of scenario um so that is the short answer to your question uh so even in the incipient market you can do some i mean you have to start somewhere you have to put some dollar and that's where the dollar figure comes like so if i could have let's say i had ended up estimating that the uh, platform can only make uh, uh, you know 50% of what uh, i had estimated so that have been the market size would have dropped to 400 million and then i would have said hey i i don't want to invest in that market essentially okay so yes you are saying you'll you'll basically still try to size for the larger uh, problem that it represents so an airbnb would then be say hospitality for example as the market will define yeah yeah so so for example let's say if you want to estimate for airbnb you would say how many passengers travel every year how much money is being spent on hotel accommodation of that travel spend would people be com- how many of them will be comfortable to uh, stay in somebody else's house uh, and uh, let's say that is 10% so if the global spend is like you know a couple of 100 billion and 10% that's just still large market where you can still go in. um so i would take that bet okay. hey priyank this is ashish um yeah. can you give an example of a market where you determined that the tech is in incubation and then you actually went back after a few years to write a check and how did you figure out if it was the right timing then yeah so uh, Uh, for example uh, uh, i have been very curious about uh, rockets and space tech basically um and within space tech if you go and look there is a lot of segments uh, where you could invest in so you could invest in satellite technology you could invest in rocket launching you could invest in data systems you could invest in subsystems of such technology um and basically uh, so i looked at for example uh, rocket space and i know sorry five ventures has an investment in that space so uh, look at the rocket space uh, look that uh, you know bunch of companies uh, so all of these companies what stage they are uh, do they already have commercialization do they have agreement signed with uh, uh, should we take uh, or they are still building uh, you know subsystem still building the first flight of the rocket has to happen uh, so where should our best dollars go in because am i going to wait that much long so suppose let's say somebody is building out uh, uh, fuel for their rocket and they haven't designed the entire rocket yet from and we go and study that market and we realize it takes 5 years to come to the final stage where you have designed the rocket and then it takes another 3 years for you to launch the rocket and then it takes another 2 years for you to actually uh, uh, get your first commercial contract so it's a 10 year process by the time you end up getting your first dollars in and now if i invest in you today i'd have to ten, wait 10 years for uh, me to be able to see your uh, dollar uh, revenue at, at which time your valuation of your company will start going up that becomes for me uh, tricky so i would say okay maybe i'll just wait it out for another 2 3 years show me that uh, their rocket is design is complete and maybe that's when i can invest because then my wait to a, you know 100 million or revenue or a billion dollar valuation would probably be cut short by 5 years uh, so let me so it's in the back of my mind i've parked it and i'll keep on meeting those companies understanding progress and as soon as any of them show that okay they have achieved a certain milestone which in my mind shows that now they are towards commercialization i'll like go and invest in them yeah so priyank yeah okay uh, should we move forward Yeah, yeah. Frank, are you there? Can anybody else hear me? much does it depend on are you looking at a seed stage are you looking at a series e a b um at what point do you want to enter into that market does that have any factor uh see uh uh i would say yes and no uh it doesn't matter actually it it matters at the stage of the company 
uh, right? So uh, how the company is doing, right? Uh, so there, because we are investing either in mature markets or we are investing in completely new markets, right? So uh, I mean, if the what I would say is the arguments for the investments will change. So in the when you are investing in a completely new market, I have to convince you that you know spending and will grow in this market and it will become a large outcome, right? So that is the question which we are trying to figure out then. Uh, whereas in a mature market, you know, I should be able to give you specifically these are the customer segments which where we can go after, and these are the customer segments. And this is how we think the money will be made. So the uh, in a mature market, the answer uh, you should have slightly more depth of an answer uh, uh, as to you know which are the segments, uh, which how we will go after. Whereas in a completely new market, I don't think there will be in a, even market segments. So you'll be building out pieces at a higher level. So now, right uh, you know taxi or the taxi cab hailing market uh, in that market at that time it was just cab hailing right so now if you look there is ride sharing there is uh, 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 ride sharing for kids there is ride sharing buses market so there is so a lot of segments have come out in the mobility market now uh, but at that time when you start off you know it's a uber problem and you are, if you you It'll be too deep to go into market segments because you have to first prove what at least one segment works. So new markets, you only work with one segment and build out that. Whereas in mature markets, you can pick and choose. Okay, I, there are so many segments, and so let me go and pick one particular segment to build for. Thesis. I mean. Got it. Okay. Uh. Can you guys see my screen, or do you see the sidebar also of where all the people are? No, no, we see only the screen. Go ahead. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so yeah, so uh, <clears throat> uh, so now we've picked up a market, and then you know, which what are the market problems? And this is where you know one of the key jobs of a VC is just to keep on reading and talking to people as much as possible. So. Uh, you know, you keep reading reports, you keep reading, uh, I keep watching YouTube videos, I, uh, I keep reading white papers that people publish, go and talk to a lot of, uh, 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 and, and you know, that requires me to just sit on my uh, uh, seat and just do all of this, right? So, and you can pick up a lot of themes just out of that. And then you go and talk to people in the market to understand, okay, what are the most immediate problems they are seeing? Because for me, everything is the same, right? I don't know which, like, for example, uh, so uh, from just by reading reports, I've picked up these uh, uh, six, seven uh, themes. Now the question comes is, uh, uh, you know, which one is to prioritize, right? So which one to choose? That's the second question then, right? So, and there are, uh, you have to understand the, so I as an investor, I have to look at that theme, I have to understand what are the problems, and then I have to kind of project and I have to prioritize which one of these will become a large problem going forward. Uh, then comes the technologies, right? So essentially technologies are, to, are the tools to solve the problems, right? And this I've picked up from Gartner report. So uh, they have done some sort of analysis and come back and said uh, in, on their technology radar in cybersecurity that, hey, uh, you know, uh, these are the different technologies which have come into the space and each technology is trying to solve some problem, maybe multiple problems. Uh, so, and some of them are immediately already there, mature technologies. Some of them are going to become important in the next three to six years. Uh, and what I would like to do is like to pick up large problems uh, and technologies which have a large impact on those large problems and then technologies which are still evolving, right? So we are trying to ahead, invest a little ahead of the curve, right? So we are trying to get the market timing right, right? So, uh, and the, see the market timing makes a difference that whether your company will become, uh, will end up having 100 million plus revenues in five years or in 10 years. and no, I, either of them are a good outcome. I don't think that's a bad outcome, but you know, obviously everybody would want a, a fast growth company uh, much earlier, right? So now within this set of radar, and I have picked up, uh, and this, this is just for illustrative purposes, I have picked up four technologies which I thought sounded interesting. Um, and and like, so we have a list of themes and we have a list of technologies, uh, essentially, right? Now, the interesting bit is, uh, you know, I just let you guys read this for a second. The, the point of the cartoon is, you know, when you start talking to folks and so we have now a list of technologies and 
you know, uh, I can tell you about these technologies right now a little bit, but then I have given you some delta information and that information does not make you an expert or me an expert, right? I just know slightly more than you. And I'm trying to, if I'm going to put money behind any of these technologies, how do I make sure that these technologies are going to stay, stick around for the next 10 years? It's, it's a very tough call, right? So there has to be some fundamental uh, thought process uh, like, you know, now when you have to project something is going to stick around for a long time, you need to have some set of beliefs and principles and uh, they, these technologies have to match that and, uh, you know, they shouldn't get disrupted. Uh, so it should make common sense is, is my point of view. Um, right. So what I'm, what I'm trying to convey from this is uh, by doing all of this research, none of us become an expert. Even by talking to experts, we are not an expert. And the expert opinion will change as technology has evolved itself, right? So we are, unfortunately, uh, it's a slightly of a moving target. So uh, again, you have to revalidate and refresh your beliefs every couple of years uh, in the tech, tech space. Somebody was asking, you know, how often do we change our thought process? Once you're building the uh, thesis, you know, essentially you learn everything new every couple of months and you keep on updating the thesis. And that's why I said it takes six to nine months uh, to actually build out a good thesis. And then post that, you know, typically one to two years, uh, that's when technology, newer technologies would have come up, you refresh the thesis, now this is what has come in the market. But now, uh, so at this point, we have some tools and we have some problems. Now, that's when you go deeper into understanding the technology, right? So you can't invest in a technology without understanding it. You know, so this is where the tech background, this is where, you know, not being afraid of diving in and understanding what it means, uh, putting on your computer science hats uh, kind of helps, right? Uh, uh, intuitively. And if you're investing deep tech, you need to be able to go in and understand a little bit of this, understand, evaluate the technology a little bit, uh, right? So in this case, I built one slide on passwordless authentication, but otherwise you would have to end up doing it uh, the similar size for all the technologies which you pick uh, fundamentally. So uh, I'll just quickly explain this to you guys. So what this basically means is uh, it's a method in which um, you don't have to enter a password to access a application. Uh, and there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, the most common which we are starting to see in India now is SMS delivered, SMS delivered codes. So you get an OTP uh, to log into, uh, some, like for example, in Swiggy. Uh, uh, Swiggy never asks you for a password now to log in. Right? You can log into your Swiggy with a mobile phone number and they will send you an OTP and you enter that. That's passwordless authentication. And multiple companies have come about in this particular space in the last few years. Um, and there are some companies which, have, which you can see uh, at the bottom right. So uh, I was able to find one Indian company. I'm pretty sure there will be more, but uh, uh, you know, if I spend time, I'll find those. And then there are some other companies in uh, Israel and US uh, globally, which have raised a lot of capital as well. Uh, and interestingly, passwordless authentication is now a theme in itself for a, a Gartner recognized and you know Porsche recognized uh, category. Uh, so you will be able to find estimates of worldwide spending as well. So you remember we started with $120 billion of cyber security spend, but then you also can break it up into separate spaces in itself, right? So there was a jump. I mean, intuitively, you could take that, break it into spaces and then go. Um, I like to go with a problems approach first, right? So I understand the problems that are there and then uh, go towards where all the money is coming from. So, so you would do this exercise of uh, building out and understanding the technologies, uh, maybe a couple of uh, uh, talking to a couple of experts, webinars again. So this, this would take a significant amount of time. Um, so to finally understand what it is, like, you know, money should be able to ask me questions about passwordless authentication. I should be able to explain it. And then he should be able to explain to me. I should be able to also explain to him. He said, he will say, you have these seven, eight companies sitting out there. Uh, why is this one company different from the other company? Right? Why, uh, you know, why is this not a winner take all? Why is one company not enough uh, to take out all the, like one company gets proven, then why not everybody else use the same company? Or for example, in uh, specifically in software companies, you know, what if there's open source alternative? You know, um, or for example, uh, you know, you see possible system software tokens, what are the pros and cons, biometric scanners, what are the pros and cons, uh, hardware tokens, what are the pros and cons? And since we are talking about cybersecurity, uh, what are the different kind of attacks which passwordless authentication prevents? Um, so this is just going deep into the technology and understanding uh, everything about the tech. And then comes the next question, right? So 
there is a competing technology or there is a, a, is there will this technology survive for 10 to 15 years or what are the other trends in the market which are happening right so today i don't think passwordless authentication uh, is going to die out in the next 20 years i mean we have been heavily dependent on passwords today and passwordless authentication is just starting to happen so it will just grow from here for the next uh, you know 15 20 years and during that time we might end up with different types of uh, uh, technologies but at least from what i see today i don't i mean that's my you know this is a sub very subjective assessment uh, of it, it being a multi decadal trend any any questions yeah priyank so in this case there are startups that already exist let's say you're looking at a new area say security for machine learning models where startups don't yet exist but it's a big problem would you write a check or would you wait to kind of for some um, marketplace to evolve or market map to show more companies no so so it's a good idea so uh, uh, ai ml for cyber security as a market already exists right uh, but uh, again it's a market which is under rapid development because ai ml itself is under rapid development and uh, uh, so depends on what is it that the company offers or within that so uh, let's see i don't yeah so for example ai ml uh, uh, which of these problems get solved by ai ml right so you could do use ai ml for devsecops you could use ai ml for third party risk for zero trust framework uh, you could use ai ml for hybrid uh, hybrid cloud adoption which of these problems the ai ml uh, problem is trying to solve for and then i will go and evaluate whether that problem is large enough and within that problem does ai ml actually make a difference or not or you know for example there are vendors who have come out uh, which are saying we will give you a risk assessment score of your company right so they will basically say i am collecting data from all different security tools which you are using and i'll give you a single executive dashboard and i use ai ml you know, i i don't think that you know ai ml plays a big part over there but yes if you are doing log analysis and you are trying to understand and correlate patterns of attack between different uh, log from different systems and then obviously it makes lot more sense so ai ml applied for that particular purpose uh, it has salience and to that particular problem or purpose is a large market then obviously ai, uh, AI ml use uh, somebody who uses ai ml to solve that problem should be able to demonstrate itself better than existing products if all these three conditions are met i would probably evaluate them for funding thanks priyank i mean just for clarity i wasn't asking ai ml to solve these problems but protecting data on which you are training your model and uh, threat of uh, let's say a uh, pixel attack against that uh, so that's again an area of uh, area that's evolving rapidly so talking about that but uh, but you have answered my question so thank you yeah, yeah so so yeah so i mean in that particular case i'll just go and talk to data scientists how often does this problem occur and they might say no it doesn't occur then uh, i'll say okay why, then why is this person building it so i'll ask that question to that uh, particular entrepreneur why are you building it looks like people don't have a problem today then he will have some hypothesis i see that in the next 5 years attacks on such data sets is going to increase because people are going to bring in uh, dirty data inside and uh, that is how hackers are going to attack it uh, and if that makes sense then i guess i could probably end up investing but i think th then comes the other part right so is it right time to invest like if i am expecting it the commercialization to happen also so when will the company start so that's the other element so see one is theoretically yes this problem exists theoretically it's a large market but then is the company at the right place right time that's field evaluation so as a thesis we so now what will happen is today i will say i have formed an idea that this is a problem and yes it's a big problem to be solved but i will wait another 2 years before uh, i should invest in that okay um, so now what we have is we have some themes and we have our technologies to solve for so uh, basically this is uh, again just very illustrative so i just picked up these themes on the left which i thought were salient and i picked up as you saw some of these technologies at random and then i'm trying to figure out which of these technologies solves for a lot of these problems and the hypothesis there is if the technology solves a lot of these problems then it is probably going to get easier to adopt having said that for example passwordless authentication as you saw in the last slide already has a very large number of uh, successful companies and it's a large market so you could potentially invest in each of those segments also right but i am since today from what i know i like this idea of a technology solving multiple problems or so that i can go and communicate the roi uh, to the buyer and if it makes sense then they will probably end up spending lot more money 
to it. Now comes the uh, validation part. So I have picked up a thesis. Uh, sorry, I picked up a technology and I have picked up multiple problems to be solved. I need to validate and all of this was theoretical till now. So I need to go start talking to experts in the market. I need to go and start talking to, uh, and like, like I said, this is all illustration. I've not been able to talk to a lot of people. So, uh, uh, you know, talk to a lot of, like, I would go and talk to the Swiggy CISO. I talk to Book My Show guys. I talk to Urban Plat. I talk to banks. Uh, I talk to government agencies. Uh, uh, try to find, connect, and uh, hey, is this a problem for you or not? Um, and this is just doing the groundwork. And, and during this process, what we'll end up finding is <clears throat> they will tell us a, a lot about the problems we are trying to solve for or other problems. And then you will be able to make a landscape of different vendors, which they talk about. They will say, okay, uh, I am using these three things and uh, I find this particular company to be the best. And I find uh, that my, these two other problems, they are not solved for. And then that will feed back into your uh, thesis that, Hey, you know, I picked up these six, seven problems, but I am seeing, Everybody else is telling me about this eighth problem and I need to go back. So it's an iterative process as well. Right? That's why it takes time. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, this is a market man, uh, map of all the companies in India provided by DSCI. Uh, so I think there are some 200 odd companies on this map. And one strategy would be just to go and talk to each one of them. Or the second strategy would be to, you know, given the theme and uh, so this is where the prioritization helps. Right. So I have picked up cloud security posture management, for example, and I'll go and say, okay, which of these companies are doing something in that cloud security posture management space? And 200 companies, five minutes on each of their websites, uh, in a couple of days, I can figure out, make a short list out of it and say, these are the companies we want to meet and talk to first. And, and it's just prioritizing. And it might happen that I might not find any company in that cloud security posture management space at all. And which is actually what happened, by the way. So uh, I couldn't find any company which is doing something like that in India, right? Essentially is it, right? So then you have stuff like, okay, other like, you know, uh, it's just happening in India. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand that question. What do you mean? So for example, in a, in a particular space, there are already five um, startups vying for that mm -hmm. space. How do you kind of estimate what is the penetration uh, of each of them and, and how of, much more space exists for new players? So most of the time we are investing in very early stage. So we will be in a situation where the market, everybody is just trying to fight for the market the market share. So all the companies will be starting off. Uh, by the time if you get to this discussion on penetration of the market, uh, then it's uh, already late. Then it's uh, probably a C, C or D stage company. Okay, so specific to this, uh, to cyber security, uh, I could find that there is already a lot of action here. So I was yeah. wondering, you know, do you have some sort of, do you try to plot like a heat map that these are areas that already that seem to be penetrated, these are not? Yeah, you would prioritize. So, uh, I mean, let's go back to the problems, right? So, so this problem space, right? So these are very, for example, cyber security talent gap. Now it has, there's a vacancy. So what does this mean? It means essentially uh, automated tools should come. So it gives you some sort of, uh, I mean, the each of these gives you some sort of idea about the product, which I have not listed here, right? So when a company comes to you, say, okay, say, is this pro will this product require a lot of services? Will this pro uh, product require additional manpower to be managed at the, uh, so, and if it does, then let's just drop it, right? So, so there are two parts. So the problems tell you what the product features should look like. Uh, so there are some of these which are direct, like for example, zero trust framework is a, is a space in which it has, it has to be done in a particular manner. It's a, almost like a tech. It's a tech, right? It's a, it's a, it's a paradigm. So whereas cyber security talent gap is a practical problem. So a paradigm, so somebody might be creating a problem a solution for zero trust framework, but will be creating with such a way that it's very automated. Then that is better than something else, which is not automated. Now, penetration wise, you will find when market start, uh, like zero trust framework, when it started, people will have five different approaches, essentially. Uh, and you have to bet on one of the approach. So somebody can say, I will bet on that approach is automated versus somebody which is not automated. So in an early market, you can do that. In a market where, in a market which is already penetrated and there are a lot of customers and a lot of spending and there's a lot of uh, startups, I would typically try to avoid that market unless the company comes and says, 
see i can tell you that in zero trust framework today everybody is solving for on premise but we are the only solution which is available for cloud and that's why we are different right so that's a even in a Makes penetrated sense. in a concentrated market you have a different shift approach Makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. So you can uh, drill down to the extent of saying that in zero trust framework, using this particular approach, there's no one doing it. So that's still a hundred percent market to go after. Yeah. 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 Uh, Frank, I had a question on that uh, matrix. You had the themes yeah. versus technology matrix. Yeah. So uh, uh, you can just go to that. Yeah. So yeah. you picked the cloud security posture management as the uh, theme. Um, Uh, as the area as a technology which covers multiple themes uh, but then you mentioned that uh, you couldn't find any startup who is working on this and then you yeah. had a list of companies you're tracking so yeah. what is the connect here are you do you think that you're tracking these companies yeah. because they could pick up uh, they are the closest to pick up this yeah, technology yeah. or no no that's right so thanks for that question so you yeah, you pick the one flaw in this thesis so basically you see uh, uh, i was building this thesis for the last week or so so that's why i picked up c uh, you know cspm and then i said okay maybe i'll find some companies in india and i couldn't find that connect um so i didn't have time to change this uh, cspm to something else but this is for illustrative purposes right so uh, one of the other things you have to do is uh, like we discussed passwordless security cspm uh, we have to also go and dig deeper and then you will find that cspm is part of a larger trend which is cloud security so if okay. today a company i can't find which is specific to cspm i will go and see cloud companies who are working in cloud security which is part of a larger trend and say okay uh, this company is already doing something in this space um, is it good or bad and if i go and tell these guys that hey you know there is these other two three things how aware are they of cspm maybe they are not talking about it today and they are building the product and they will come out with it one year later so i have to track those companies as well so this is a thesis i had uh, built a step by step guide as well uh, but i wanted to keep it concise so i'll just quickly tell you the sar uh, so let me walk you so first we dived into the market i'll just do a recap quickly uh, market so we went to the market uh, in market the key considerations are willingness to spend money on a problem Uh, and there it is defined by whether it's a painkiller or a vitamin right so uh, having dashboards building dashboards might be good enough in cyber security but it's might it is just a vitamin a uh, solving preventing hacking is a painkiller right so uh, and uh, some if you go and ask somebody they will say i'll pay money for the painkiller not the vitamin and uh, similarly right so business loss regulatory compliance reputation risk are some of the you know painkillers Uh, which uh, people need uh, for in cyber security then you jump into whether it's a large enough market large enough we already discussed so i'm just how each of these got built right so essentially at the end of a, a checklist for a market is it's a painkiller uh, problem uh, willingness to pay the large outcomes possible enough money available to be built now within that we then we dived into where to invest so uh, you know you identify multiple teams to understand the technologies uh, we did all of this um, you know picking up teams so essentially the net of it is understand market problems understanding the evolving technologies prioritizing the technology that have maximum impact and choosing a technology that addresses multiple problems then comes the third phase which is validation of uh, uh, what technologies and team you have picked up so uh, you basically step into the wild uh, no longer sitting on the chair you go in uh uh talk to experts uh you know you to validate your thinking you ask them you know will they pay you try to understand which are the customer segment so we what we didn't cover in the thesis and uh, it can be a, so the, the thesis when it goes much more detailed is uh you know what are the customer segments right so is it a small business problem it is a mid market problem is it a enterprise problem uh and who is win, how much are they willing to pay and because that helps you define how the gtm is going to be so somebody is going to pay you 1000 uh, dollars for a uh, software per year you know you can't go and send a, a sales person to him you know you have to sell it online um, so that is what uh, allows for gtm so it, once you do this analysis by talking to customers you also kind of get a sense when a founder comes to you how is he thinking about gtm because just by building a great product you can't build a great business right so uh, you want to invest in great businesses which have great products so 
you need to understand that level of gtm as well and also it will give you things like when you start talking to people okay uh, you are going to use let's say this uh, cloud security product uh, will you uh, one year later uh, evaluate whether you should remove it or not and the customer says hey you know once i have deployed it i don't know where all it will get deployed it will be very difficult for me to remove it from my uh, public cloud uh, and that's why i don't think i'll be able to remove it and once you hear that answer you know there is some sort of sickness right so whoever gets into that account first will be able to just uh, penetrate that account and keep on making more and more money on that account um, and that's why it could become a winner take all market also possibly um so that is the kind of uh, so you kind of try to get a sense on product features as well uh, by doing this analysis and talking to customers uh the other thing which you want to know is uh, you know like i said right now or, or later one of the things is timing of the market right so they people are saying yeah it's a problem but you know uh, today we don't see this because uh, we are not using the uh, so much of public cloud we are using private cloud only uh, so then you i want to wait out uh, the market or how much like i already discussed how much will they pay are they willing to pay 5000 15000 30000 $30, what is that number um and uh, the i think the last point you know what other problems can this technology solve for them can it become a platform that is the uh, answer if you can find and uh, that makes it the difference between a billion dollar company and 10 billion dollar company so if you look uh, companies like uh, Palo Alto Networks, uh, which is a cybersecurity company, what they have done is they are becoming fast, becoming a platform. So they are uh, they are becoming a platform where everybody else has to hook into their stuff, and they manage access to everything. Uh, so it has become a platform, and now nobody can replace them, and they make additional dollars as more and more uh, technologies hook into them. And for some other technology to become big, it has to hook into Palo Alto Networks, uh, and the in the especially in the b2b saas enterprise space you can find these large platform like salesforce has become a platform service now is a platform workday is a platform uh, similarly in security uh, you know you have uh, crowdstrike palo alto networks other companies like that uh, becoming platforms um, so if you can find a company in a space which can become a platform uh, then that's uh, you know you hit gold and there you should not even think about it you should just go and invest in that company but typically it will be uh, you know you will get to know whether a company can become a platform probably a year later um, uh, or so after you spent enough time on the problem and you see all possible things that company can do yeah uh, we already discussed this and bank customer segments so uh, basically what we are saying is uh, uh, the net of this is often you talk to customers we validate the initial hypothesis which we did in phase 3 uh, then we validate customers willing to pay we understand which of the industry set like is it bfsi is it auto is it retail which is going to be an early adopter of the solution uh, we understand which size of customer will be easiest to sell to which allows you to understand gtm and then at this point of time you have understanding of market you have understanding of tech and product you have understanding of the uh, customer segments you uh, and gtm you have now formed some point of view uh, of the uh, thesis like so this is the expanded thesis by the way so what i showed you guys was a mini thesis this is now we are having some point of view and then you choose the company right so then from this you kind of figure out okay all the companies we have to meet all of them you have to understand each of their solutions uh, uh, you will enhance your own understanding of gtm and then finally you will do deal evaluation so finally you will get a you will do one on meeting one hour calls with all of these companies and you will say okay of the 100 companies i met these 10 companies i should spend more time with and that's when you start doing deal evaluation right um and then we will form a point of view which is finally educated right that's what brings it to uh, you know good dish which is our thesis uh, basically sorry so that's that's where i end that's all you also initially go about picking some sectors and uh, you know building some thesis and then say that uh, you know unless something exciting comes in we are not going to kind of expand our horizon specifically to do with thesis thank you want to take that yeah so in my case here i actually am always on the lookout for new ideas because the vc business is always to be ahead of the curve right so if i can do a investment uh, after which everybody wakes up and does i will be in a better shape so you know it's always about finding out that's that's my answer yeah, yeah. for us Any, uh, um, 
Yeah, let's take the other question. Prajwal, go ahead. Sorry, Manish, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, I can answer Rankur later also. I think uh, sure. Priyank's time is more important. Uh, any... uh, fine. Uh, I like this, so I, I can stick around. Okay. Sure. Uh, any tips on uh, you know, assessing the maturity of technology? Uh, you must have gone to see. Uh, but it is tough. tough. It is not easy. It, it, it is not easy. Uh, especially cutting edge technologies is very hard. So the yeah. best thing you can do is you can talk to researchers, you can talk to practitioners who are going to use the product and figure out uh, what they say about it. And you can yeah. be wrong also. So, yeah. Thanks. So Priyan, just uh, following up on the previous answer that you gave, I'm just wondering, like, where do you get your news from? Like, to, to stay ahead of the curve, like, what are the main channels that you follow to see what's coming? Well, there are a lot of uh, a lot of places. Uh, so if you were looking at, and it depends on the category. So if you were looking at developer tools, for example, uh, you can look at Hacker News, uh, Product Hunt for latest products which are coming out. Uh, you know, you have Forrester and Gartner reports uh, which are coming out all the time. Uh, you have uh, like technology radars, so many people uh, write about the latest trends. Uh, and as you start spending time in that space, for example, cybersecurity, you'll realize that uh, uh, there are a few leading uh, authority voices, essentially, uh, who are doing uh, interesting stuff and they keep on putting out uh, stuff. We also keep on tracking open source projects, uh, GitHub uh, repositories. So there's a lot of data available out in the market uh, where you can see. Uh, that you know these things are happening. 